We would like to welcome everyone back uh, after our uh, break to uh, our Orthodox uh, Bible study series. Uh, in particular, uh, we're studying the Gospel of St. Matthew. And we welcome not only those of you who are joining us here uh, at uh, Warren, St. Nicholas and Warren, but we also uh, welcome every one of you who are part of uh, the uh, viewing by way of the internet. Uh, now, as we begin, as is our custom, let us offer the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illumine our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your gospel. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies of Christ God, and to you we give glory, together with your eternal Father, your all holy, gracious, and light creating spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. We are in the Gospel of St. Matthew, in particular chapter 23, and we left off at verse 13. Those of you who are joining us, and uh, those of you who are here, if you have the uh, Orthodox Study Bible, uh, and we're talking about the one with the Old and New Testament, is on page 1313. A good lucky number. 1313. If uh, you'll permit me to kind of uh, summarize what we talked about before so we can be in the proper mind to continue on, uh, we have Jesus now coming to the end of his ministry and uh, at the end uh, being attacked purposefully by the religious authorities, especially the Pharisees, who try to test him, who demand proof uh, of his identity and the reasons why he, are, he is doing the things that he is doing. And as a result, all of these things being done because it is actually a rejection of Jesus and who he is. You see? It's a rejection. And uh, previous to this, we have Jesus giving to the Pharisees credit as those who, uh, as it says in the text, who uh, hold the chair of Moses. They are indeed uh, the authority. And God does not, or rather Jesus does not, criticize them for the authority that has been invested into them. He recognizes their right to sit on the seat of, of Moses. Now, remember symbolically in, in, in biblical uh, thought, uh, a teacher, whenever he was instructing his uh, disciples, uh, the position was sitting. And it was uh, symbolic of one's authority to be able to teach that which he is going to teach. So therefore, uh, Moses, uh, being the prophet, you see, he is called the great prophet in the Old Testament. In fact, in the Pentateuch, uh, we hear and see written uh, the prophecy that there will come one who will be a prophet like Moses. So that we are talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, who is a, a type of Moses uh, and a fulfillment of the role of Moses. Because uh, Moses spoke as prophet, and a prophet is, is an individual who speaks God's words. If you remember some of the symbolisms and some of the things that happened uh, where God's Word was actually put into their mouth with their finger, you see? 
and they would speak God's word uh, whenever Israel was coming unto judgment for the sins that they have committed, the disobedience to the commandments, and and the the most importantly, the turning of the heart, the hardening of the heart, uh, their lack of sincerity, their lack of repentance, and although these men have the authority of Moses, they do not practice what they preach, you see. Uh, they do not properly understand the spirit of the teaching of Moses. And this is why they are attacking Jesus and trying to trip him and trying to trick him and uh, uh, ultimately uh, doing this for the fact that they are rejecting him and for his demise, correct? Okay, so uh, therefore um, uh, our Lord is uh, criticizing them, calling them uh, hypocrites, uh, people who say one thing and do another thing, and he calls them unto judgment. Now for them, is the time of decision. Either we are going to accept Him for who and what He is, and His, his preaching, His proclamation of the Gospel, or we're going to reject Him. And we see this, this process of rejection that is beginning. And this rejection Ultimately, the Lord is going to warn the authorities and the people of Israel of the consequences of their decisions. You will be held responsible for the consequences of rejecting me and the one who sent me and the word that he has come to preach. You see? And one of the very typical styles of writing that we find in prophetic literature in the Old Testament is what are called uh, the woes. And what do we mean by these woes? Um, the best way that I can use this uh, as a way of uh, kind of uh, association in order to understand uh, I remember uh, as a child, uh, my mother um, and that generation where they would shake their finger or, uh, oh, you know, they would have a certain moan or something like that. It would, it would shriek, we would shriek in fear, you see. And uh, woe is me, you know, woe is you. In other words, it means that something's going to happen. Because, as we said at the very beginning, very, very beginning of our study, whenever we come into the presence of God, it is, we, we come into judgment. Okay? We have to be accountable for uh, what we have done. And we have to make a decision. Either we are going to follow Him, we are going to accept Him as the Son of Man, and all of these other things that we've been talking about, we're going to reject Him. And what happened in, in uh, certain uh, places within the prophetic literature that used these woe is you type of terminology or style of writing, in fact, even literally, what happened was that, that God was bringing Israel to trial. Now, if you go back into the Old Testament, uh, it was on Mount Sinai that Moses ascended, you remember? And it was on Mount Sinai where God's law was given to Moses. It was written on the stone tablets uh, with his finger, you know, to use some of these terminologies and symbols. And it was given to Moses to take down and to be able to teach the children of Israel. And along with this, was the sacred act of making a covenant. 
Okay? And what is a covenant? A covenant has both legal connotations and it has a spiritual connotation. In the ancient world, businessmen, when they were, were discussing business and discussing, if you will, contracts, you had an oral agreement, or I, I remember uh, back when I was a kid growing up in the 60s, uh, you know, the old saying, my uncle used to say, you're as good as your handshake. You said, you, 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 you give your word, you shake, that seals the deal. There technically should be no need to call a lawyer and draw up a contract. But now, we become very juridical as a society because of our lack of respect for the dignity of our name and, and the sacredness of these promises and agreements that we make. And uh, whenever uh, uh, Israel was given uh, this, uh, uh, the law, uh, God makes a solemn uh, covenant. It, it is a type of legal slash spiritual agreement made between two people. In this case, God being the superior of the two parties, and man and mankind, you and I, and Israel being the inferior agent of this transaction. In legal agreements of the time, usually it was between uh, equal partners, you see. But in this case, unique in that, it was the supreme authority of God making a covenant with His creatures, His creation. And the, the covenant was uh, made, and the covenant basically is this, the agreement is this, that Israel would keep God's law, that they would be faithful to Him, and put their complete trust in Him. And His part of the agreement was that He will be their God, who will deliver them, who will protect them, and who will provide for them. See? And while Israel wandered in the wilderness for the 40 years, everything was taken away from them, and taken away from them purposely to teach them to completely rely on God. Completely and totally rely on God. For ourselves, for our sustenance, for our existence, for everything. Because everything is a gift of God. And it is given in this covenant relationship with the agreement of Israel and you and I that we would keep the law and that we would obey His commands and that would be faithful to Him. Okay? And in the legal sphere of existence of that time, if someone dared break this sacred covenant, what happened is the innocent party would approach the one whom he accuses of breaking the covenant and basically give a list of woes or a list of grievances that you have committed as conclusive proof of your dishonesty and as a result, you break the law. You break the covenant. You see? So therefore, what is happening now, Jesus is using His authority as the Son of Man. Let's just use this as a, a typical uh, uh, messianic title that we can use in reference to Jesus. And He is now as God making a list of ways by which Israel broke the covenant. They broke the sacred agreement. They broke the, the treaty, if you will, the agreement, that, the, the sacred agreement that they had between God 
and man and man and God. So therefore, in this next uh, section, uh, a lot of uh, theologians refer to this as the section of the woes, or the section of actually a list of complaints that God now issues justifiably to the subordinate part of the, the agreement, His people Israel. And we see this as being very typical in the Old Testament literature. Because in the prophetic writings of the Old Testament, the prophets over and over again warned Israel that they are being unjust. Uh, they are cheating and lying in the marketplace. The scales are rigged. Uh, they, they are even called... Uh, 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 to uh, accountability uh, and even, even prostituting themselves, leaving the devotion to Yahweh, uh, to the God of Israel, and following other pagan gods. What was the first thing that happened while uh, Moses was up on the mountain for the 40 days? Israel got disgusted, they got kind of discombobulated and and, and uh, so they got all the gold and they made the calf, the golden calf, and they started worshiping the golden calf. You see? To which Moses uh, throws down the, the tablets, breaks the tablets, and, and the judgment of God falls on the statue and the, the worshipers of that statue who are consumed. You see? And this is what is happening right now with the people of Israel. Jesus is going to give them a list of grievances that he has against them for the, the blatant violations of not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. So therefore we turn to chapter 23, verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Very harsh words, to say the least. For you shut up the kingdom of God against men. For you neither go in yourself, nor you allow those who are entering to go in. They make the requirements of the law so burdensome that not only do they not enter into righteousness, okay, but they cause other people not to enter also because they level up for them so many laws and rules and regulations and ordinances that is physically impossible to keep. So he says to them, not only are you to be condemned because you don't follow your own law, so therefore you are not going to enter God's kingdom, you're not going to be ushered into Abraham's bosom, to put it another way. But now, you cause other people to fumble and not enter. This is, this is an awful thing that has happened. Because now you made it so that no one can enter. You made it too difficult, you see. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. This is woe number two. For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Wow. Okay? What are we talking about here? Whenever they want to act in a particular way, they find a way to go around the law and circumvent the letter of the law. And they do this when it benefits them. When it comes to, to their responsibility to care for the widows, to care for the poor, the orphan, which is the woes that the prophets issued against Israel centuries before. The reason why they were carried off into the Babylonian captivity and punishment. Okay? Here they are doing the same thing. They do not properly care for the needs of others, this love of neighbor of which Jesus says. For they make pretense, they make long prayers, 
They look and act piously, but inwardly they do not properly care for those who are in need, to those who are entrusted to their care. And as a result, they are given the warning of woe. For he says to them, you will receive a greater condemnation. According to the theology in the New Testament book of James, he points out very clearly that those who have given much will be expected much. Those who have give, been given positions of power, authority, whether to govern or to teach as the chair of Moses and the heirs of that chair, that God will expect more of them because they know better. They can't plead ignorance like the people that they teach. You see, they know better. And if you know better, then you will be held more accountable for the sins and transgressions you commit. There is an old saying, you know, the higher up you go, the greater the fall. This is exactly what is being implied here. And therefore they are given a solemn warning. You're educated. You know the law. You have been instructed. You have been privileged in being given this position as to sit on Moses' seat. But you do not practice what you preach. And as a result of this hindrance, you fall under the judgment of God. Because you should know better. You see? I remember one time when uh, my brother and I, uh, he's a few years older, we were uh, roughhousing and getting into all kind of trouble. And uh, my mother comes into the room, of course, we're both sitting there, you know, and uh, she sees that something's broken and this is turned over and, and so forth. And, and she says, okay, she says, both of you are at fault. And because Rich was older, my older brother was older, he got punished first, then it was my turn. And you know what my mother told him? You know better, you're older. You should be looking out for your brother and teach your younger brother and provide an example. See? So his punishment was a little bit more severe than mine. So this is what the Lord is talking. The, the, the greater, the more that you know, the more the responsibility you have, the more is expected you from God. And you will be judged accordingly. Now we have another woe, which would be the third woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to make one proselyte. What is a proselyte? A proselyte is a non-Jew or a Gentile who uh, Israel sought out in order to convert to, to, to Judaism. Uh, in the time prior to the coming of Christ, historically, uh, proselytizing was very popular by the Israel, uh, the people of Israel. And because of the respect uh, that many in the uh, Roman world had for their law and their theology and so forth, there are, there are many people who, who converted to Judaism. Okay? He says, you go through all kind of trouble to convert one proselyte. But when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. In the early church, we see in the Acts of the Apostles, the stoning of St. Stephen the First Martyr. Are you you're familiar with that? Okay. At that particular time, there were two basic groups. There were what would be called the Judaizers, who were the traditional Jews, okay, and what they called the Hellenists, or the synagogue of the freedmen. 
And uh, as a result, what happened was that, that because of the, 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 the example that was given to them, these proselytes became even more stringent than their teachers. And we see in the Acts of the Apostles that these proselytes, these Gentile converts, were even more severe in their judgment and rejection of Christianity than their Jewish counterpart. See what I mean? So this is what was happening, that they uh, are, are, are taught to be uh, more uh, uh, rigorous and, and strict even than their teachers themselves. Okay? So therefore, they are even more so finding themselves under condemnation. Because they too were given much. And in their over-exuberance, uh, judging other people and, and uh, the different things that they were doing, they also will even more find themselves being condemned into the fires of hell. We have another woe. Woe to you blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. You see where their priority is? Huh? They betray themselves, don't they? What is more important, the gold of the temple or the temple? See? And what a foolish understanding it would be to say that, well, if we take our oath and we, 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 we pledge it according to the, the riches of the temple, the gold of the temple, and not the temple, our Lord criticizes it by saying this, that you are fools and you are blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple who sanctifies the gold? Okay? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is in the altar, he is obliged to perform it. You fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift? or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it and all the things on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God himself and God who sits upon it. Okay, uh, we uh, have to be able to understand that the sacred vessels that were a part of the temple, uh, the holy rites that were performed at the temple, and the tradition that was handed down by the fathers, uh, these practices were, were, were being expressed, and, and these practices were, were important as far as a deepening of faith, okay? But yet, uh, we are called upon to utilize this to lead us to a deeper commitment to God uh, and to be able to, to transform our hearts, to be able to follow Him, and to be able to hold as more sacred God who dwells in the temple. The altar that is the sanctifying force. And nothing that we construe is greater, you see, than God and then the temple of God. These things are a means by which we approach God, you see. They are aids, if you will, but cannot replace the, the ultimate dignity and majesty of God in His temple. Okay? We come now to another woe. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is justice and mercy and faith. Here, your concern with cumin and anise and mint, which are the smallest of these herbs and spices and so forth, but yet you neglect the more important thing. You are concerned with the minute performances of the law, but yet at the same time your heart is hardened and you don't practice mercy and compassion and forgiveness. This is the more important aspect of the law. To love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and, and uh, uh, all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Not the external things of our faith. St. Paul put it very well when he says, when you do this type of thing, you rob religion of its power. You reduce it to some kind of a legalistic format where what God is trying to get us to do is not so much, uh, you know, clean the cup properly or, or do this in a proper way or, or, or ritually purify yourself. But what He's trying to get us to do is to practice mercy and compassion and justice, which are the qualities of God. This is how God acts. All of these things have been given to us. The law has been given to us to, to kind of guide us and, and protect us and guide us in the proper way to become God-like. And as a result, the religious liter leaders of Israel, in particular we're talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, are more concerned with the minute details of, of the law and not forgiveness and mercy and compassion. And how many times we see that practice in our lives today? All right? So they broke the law. So they took something or did it. But how are we reacting to it? Are we being understanding? Are we reaching out? Are we being compassionate? Are we willing to, to, to forgive other people? To give them a second chance? You see? All of these things there... They, 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 they are hardened against. Just like the prophets of the Old Testament that criticized the people of Israel the same way. You're in concern with making money and being a success in life, and you're more concerned about, you know, where you stand in the temple or the synagogue and, and what kind of clothes you wear or what titles you're given, or like these things that we talked about last time but you don't practice mercy, compassion, and justice. That means nothing at all if you cannot be compassionate, forgiving, and loving. Because ultimately, God is justice, mercy, compassion. So therefore, uh, the reason uh, why the law was given was to make us God-like. You know? In the Orthodox Church, we refer to this as, in the ascetical writings, as the act of theosis, becoming more and more like God, by imitating Him, by making God a part of us. And how do we show that we are God-like, that we are children of God? When we are just, merciful, and compassionate. The other things mean nothing. They're not important. Don't fret over the little things, but worry about the things that are supposed to matter. That's why God has done all that He does. And that's why the Lord is going to do all that He does. And we will see within Him the perfect example of obedience to that law. When? When He suffers the passion and when he dies on the cross. 
When he says from the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. See? Remember I told you a long time before this that Christ not only gives with his mouth the decree, the teaching, but practices that and provides a way to follow him. So therefore, he says, these you sought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. The Pharisees of the first century, whenever they were drinking from a container, so that they would not be contaminated for eating or drinking something that was not kosher, they would use a little uh, uh, strainer. Like whenever my uh, mother used to make soup, she would use a strainer and, and, and put in a, in, in, a, in a pot all of the, the broth, and then the, uh, the, the vegetables and so forth she would save and cut up and so forth and add it to the broth and, and you know, kind of heat it up again. Uh, so this, this strain, they would put a strainer on uh, the cup and these other different things so that they would not swallow something like a fly or something like that where, that would defile them. They were all concerned by all of these ritual impurities that what happened was Instead of worry about swallowing the gnat, they swallow a camel. The camel, which was the biggest animal known in this area of the world. You, you, you see, you're worried about the, the, the little tiny thing that you can barely see. And because of your hypocrisy, you, you, you do worse. Okay? Here, you see the symbolism. Here, you're worried about this little tiny nap, and here you, you, you swallow the camel. Okay? You swallow the camel. We have another woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion, you know what extortion is, uh, and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees cleanse first the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may also be clean. In the Pharisaic thought, in obedience to all of these laws that they found, uh, 613 laws that they found in, in the Torah, the books of Moses, uh, many of them uh, were concerned with uh, proper ritual cleanliness. And what happens is, in order to have something ritually cleanse you, they would take water and they would wash ceremonially the, the outside of the cup or the outside of the dish and before they would be able to be able to make use of it. And what the Lord is saying, the inside is what is polluted. If you want a clean cup, you have to wash the inside of the cup, not just the outside. And also, too, we, we have to understand this in an allegorical way, as many of the fathers have taught, that it's not just cleaning dishes and cups that Jesus is concerned about. He's talking about ourselves. See? They were more concerned about the outside exterior and weren't concerned about what was happening inside. Didn't our Lord tell them before that it is not what goes into your mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out? Because it comes from the heart. It is a true expression of what you truly are. And how many times in, in our hypocrisy, you know, we put on the proper face, we put on the proper dress, we do the proper external actions, but internally our hearts are far from God. I think David said it well 
at the end of Psalm 50, which tradition says that after uh, he had sinned with Bathsheba uh, and was confronted by the prophet Nathan, that God saw, he, did, he thought he escaped God, but God saw what he did. And after uh, Nathan confronted him in remorse and repentance, tradition says that David wrote the 50th Psalm. And at the very end of that psalm, he writes, If you would have desired sacrifice, I'd given it. Alright? If you would have told me, go take this bowl and sacrifice on an altar, or do this external thing, this ritual thing, or offer this prayer, or whatever, I would have gladly done it. But, he says, a contrite heart and a humble spirit proper sacrifice to God. You see? What is the disposition of your heart? You know, before we come to liturgy, we, we take a shower or bath, and uh, we comb our hair, and, and put on makeup, and, 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 and put on the, our, our better clothes, the best clothes that we have, and all these other different things. And we may go through the proper actions. But, going back to what was said before, if we do not have in our heart mercy, compassion, forgiveness, love, means nothing. But it becomes hypocrisy. You see? What God desires is a contrite and humble heart. One of the most severe criticisms that the prophets gave the people of Israel was he said that they had a hard heart. They had a hard stone heart. One of the prophets said very beautifully that there will come a time when God will create a new age, a renewed age, where he will take the stone heart from our chest and put in a living human heart. See? That will allow us to repent and to practice mercy, compassion, and justice. You see? This is what the Lord's will is. This is what His desire is. So He tells them, you cleanse the inside first. You confess your sins. You deal with the sins that you commit. Don't worry about what everyone else is committing. Judge not that ye not be judged. And our Lord also says, the, the, the judgment that you give to other people will be the same judgment that you will be judged with. And let me tell you something. God have mercy on all of us if He judges us like us, like we judge other people. Thanks be to God that He will be our judge. Why? Because He is merciful, just, and compassionate. See? That's it. Okay? So therefore, cleanse the inside. We properly prepare ourselves to come into the presence of God when our souls are clean, and our conscience are clean, when our sins are forgiven, and we are are reconciled. In fact, our Lord said, before we read this, before when you offer your gift at the altar, if you remember that someone has sinned against you, what do you do? Leave the gift, go back, be reconciled with your brother, then you'll be in a position to offer the gift. You see, this is the, 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 the same kind of spirit. And this is what he saw lacking, lacking in these teachers of the law who sat in Moses' chair. Okay? Another woe. All right? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but he said, inside are full of dead men's bones 
and all kinds of uncleanness. Another translation, I think is a part of the, the, the RSV, is filled with rottenness. In the Judaic practice, the Pharisaic practice, if one came in contact with a dead body, you were contaminated. Okay? Uh, and uh, in order to avoid coming in contact with anything that is dead, so that you do not accidentally brush up against the tomb of someone uh, who's buried there that would defile you, what the practice was were to take these tombs and take whitewash, white paint, if, if you will, and wash the side, and you know that if you saw, oh, that's a tomb, walk around it. Okay? He says, you're just like that when you, when you act this way. But he says, inwardly, you're full of dead man's bones. There's nothing that smells worse than a decaying body. Once you smell that, you, it, it gets into your brain. You can't forget it. It's awful. See? You're filled with rottenness. You are filled with dead bones and all kinds of uncleanness. Even so, also outwardly you appear righteous before men. They do the right thing. They say the right thing. They offer the right prayers. They're in temple on time. All of these other different things, they follow all the legal requirements, they eat the proper food, they wash the cup and, uh, and, and plate the same way, all these different things. Outside, he says, everything hunky may seem hunky-dory, but inside you are full of hypocrisy, and you are lawless. See? The inside that matters, not the outside. Another one. <laughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and you say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Israel, historically, over the centuries, always persecuted the men of God, the prophets. They persecuted them, they killed them. Okay? If you remember the story of one of my favorite prophets, uh, uh, Elijah, Elijah was running away for his life because the queen, the wicked queen, was seeking out to kill him because of the harsh things that he had to say in judgment of her. And, and, and of, of, of the, 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 uh, the empire, the, the, the reign, the kingdom. You see? That there is persecution. That they have participated. But yet, we, we, we sinfully and naively say, Oh no, we would have never done something like that. You know, how many times, you know, people in, in judging other people say, Oh, I would have never took that money. I would have never... You know what? There's an old saying my mother used to say. There by the grace of God go I. Before you start judging other people, you don't know how you would have acted given the same circumstances. You don't know. And if you would escape, it's by God's grace. See? It's by God's grace. So therefore, you show your hypocrisy. And you know what? Ironically, people that talk like this are the first ones to do it. You set yourself up for the fall, don't they? And it comes as a warning. Okay? Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves. You testify against yourself. You are the one that is responsible for your own condemnation because of how you act. That you say that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. He says, be responsible for what you do. 
Serpents and brood of vipers. Wow. <laughs> it's really getting bad here. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Okay? If you remember in the Bible, the book of Genesis, the first murder, Cain slew Abel. The last murder that is recorded in the historical books was Zechariah. Okay? And he says, the Lord says to them, that the, the, this brood of vipers, the, the, these poisonous snakes, it, this is what we become when we act in this, in this particular way. He says, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. You know, God sends to us our priests and bishops. Okay? And we are called upon to receive them and their word and their teaching. Although they are not perfect, although they themselves are sinners, but still they come with the authority of God. But yet at the same time, those whom God sends, and if you should scourge them or persecute them or, or, or be unrighteous before with them, that you also will be guilty of the blood that your fathers shed, all the way from Abel to Zechariah. You will receive the same fate. You will receive the same condemnation. Okay? In fact, the Zechariah ben Berakshah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, assuredly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Okay? These are seven woes. Seven protests that Jesus ushers to the people of Israel as they fall under condemnation. And these particular woes uh, are a part of what we need to hear to make sure that we do not emulate, if you will, uh, the example of these scribes and Pharisees to dedicate ourselves to cleaning the inside and not to persecute uh, those whom God sends to us, but rather to honor them, to be respected, despite their sins and their flaws. They are still doing the work of God. One of the most beautiful parts of the liturgical services that we serve, and and uh, those of uh, you who uh, are celebrating, or after uh, you, are, you have celebrated the Feast of Theophany, uh, some of you are just getting over the Feast of the Nativity, if you're on the Old calendar. But when you uh, celebrate the Feast of Theophany, and you have the great uh, blessing of water, the priest, uh, who is the head of the community, sent by God, ordained by God, uh, reads the prayer of St. Sophronius of, of Jerusalem. And one of the beautiful passages, uh, parts of that prayer, is uh, to, if I may paraphrase, O Lord, uh, our God, I call upon you to hear my prayer, to hear my request, and not to withhold your, your Holy Spirit from this place or this water because of my own sinfulness. But allow your grace to flow through me to, to grant the blessing to which we have been called to do. You see? And, and I think this is germane to what we're talking about here. 
to be able to uh, 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 have in respect and to be able to follow and to remember that before God, no one is righteous, as the, as the psalmist says. No, not one. There is only one righteous one, is our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. And He is the only one that can judge. Okay? So uh, we're going to close uh, at this time uh, with this heavy material and this uh, legal charge that is being ushered against uh, the scribes and Pharisees and those who reject the Lord. Uh, and uh, we uh, see now the negation of the old covenant that was made. That old covenant being negated by them calling for the crucifixion of the Son of God Himself. And when we come back next week, God willing, uh, we will continue that theme as we progress in our study of the Gospel of St. Matthew. So when we come back, we will be in Matthew 23, and we're going to start verse 37. Again, we thank all of you for being here. We thank you for coming. Uh, those of you who are uh, part of the internet audience, we appreciate you tuning in. We encourage you to share this with others. Uh, and um, we, uh, as we conclude, we stand and we offer our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are truly deserving of glory, O birth giver of God, the ever-blessed and most pure Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim, who as a virgin gave birth to God the Word, true birth giver of God, we magnify you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is among us. Yes, shall we.